Hello and welcome to another edition of Critical Q&A, the show where I answer your questions based on what you've left for me in the comments section of my Q&A videos or have sent to me by email at askchrisshelton at gmail.com. Um, some really interesting news um, that I wanted to start promoting is um, I'm going to be doing a, a book signing of my book, Scientology A to Xenu, on May 1st, uh, so a month from now, in Los Angeles at the Center for Inquiry of Los Angeles. And I'll put a link below um, uh, to let you know, what, you know where, where and when and all that. Uh, so you can look that up. It's going to be at 11 a.m. It's going to be a, a Sunday. And I think it's going to be fun. And I'll also, the, the event is not just me showing up and, and signing books. There's going to be a whole talk by Jamie DeWolf and by me, and of course I'll bring copies of my books, and if you have one, then you can bring it and I will sign it. So that should be fun. Also, um, my podcast partner Ruth and I are going to be at the Reason Rally, and we're not slated to do any speaking at the Reason Rally. I won't be on stage with Richard Dawkins or Johnny Depp or anything like that, but um, but we will be there, and we will be doing live video tweeting from there, and we're working out our plans on what else we're going to be doing from there. And I think that's going to be a lot of fun, too. So that'll be in Washington, D.C. That'll be June 4th. That's a Saturday. And, um, and we'll be there. So I hope to see you guys there. And so now, let's get on with your questions. Sharon. Chris, as you know, I watch all your video posts and have recently read your book, which I love and enjoy. I still have some questions. I think the answers might have something to do with the mindset of Sea Org slash staff members. But here goes. Why does going clear and getting to the higher OT levels take so long? An example was Tim DeWall, who explained his mission to get to clear, and years later he's no nearer. If the primary goals are to clear the planet and save all mankind, and the Scientologists believe they are in a race against time, why is it so difficult? I know it might be to drain money out of people and the levels actually don't work, but if the Sea Org and staff members genuinely believe what they are doing, rather than knowingly perpetuating the con, why are the case supervisors not approving people moving on more quickly or easily? Well, the real answer to the question, of course, is that it is a con and that these states of being are something that are carrots on a, on a, str on a string, right, that people keep, keep chasing after and that's why they keep paying for it. And, but, but why? Why does, um, why does anybody who's within the world of Scientology put up with it or, or how do they get, go along with this? And the reason is that the, or what happens in the world of Scientology is that, that the people, the case supervisors and the auditors and the staff members do want people to get to clear and get up to OT and they do want them to do it quickly. They actually do. They, they, they are in this mindset that they believe that these advanced courses is what they call them, the OT levels, these advanced levels are the secret to saving the world. And they think that by getting people up to those levels and getting themselves up to those levels, that the that everything's going to change and that the world's going to become this musical, uh, musical, beautiful, wonderful, you know, butterflies and unicorns sort of place. So what happens is they, the the stops and the and the slows and the barriers to making it happen are introduced from the top. They come down from the top. They come from RTC or from International Management of Scientology, which you know has, is and pretty much always has been for the last three decades has been David Miscavige. Um, it serves his interests to have everything go really slow because it doesn't work, right? The, the, the con has a, a carrot that is a dried, shriveled, yucky carrot that, you know, once you get your hands on it, it doesn't taste so good. You know, it's, it's horrible. But when you, when you keep it out there where people can't really see it so well, right, they keep going after it. And, um, and that's what happens in Scientology is people keep, they have this, this, this idea in their head that this wonderful thing exists and, and it doesn't. 
And if they get there and then realize that, they leave. And that's what has happened to a lot of people who have reached the upper levels of the bridge of, of Scientology is they've left and they're now critics or, or at least they, they don't participate anymore. So Miscavige has to convince those people who have reached those levels or people who are on their way to those levels that they didn't really get the full gains and benefits because they did something wrong. And that's why they're constantly being re-put back down and made to redo things that they've already done two, three, four times, right? And pay for the privilege of doing it. So, um, so it's not for lack of trying, it's not for lack of wanting, and it's not because the staff or the public, um, you know, are, are, are okay with the fact that they can't get to these levels. They want to. And in fact, a common reason why people leave is because they, the runway has just been made you know, so long, so extraordinarily, insanely long and, and, and arduous that, that they just can't deal with it anymore and they leave. And I, I worked with a lot of such people when I was recovering people into Scientology and trying to, trying to get them to, come on, you know, you can still make it, you know, sort of thing. And, um, and, and, you, know, and you can do that. You can, uh, you know, you can get people thinking... Uh, that they can achieve it again and, you know, put some more false promises and hopes there and get them to come back and, and try again, right? But I think as, as, uh, as the word has gotten out more and more over the last 10 years about it, more and more people are wise to the, the con and so that's why less and less people are involved. Anon C. What do you think of Russia's recent banning of Scientology in the country? I have seen anti-Scientology people who say that the way Russia went about it was morally wrong. I don't know about morally wrong, but systemically wrong, I think it was, because um, it was a sort of a 1984 approach where they were just going to sort of take an authoritarian, uh, you know, thou, the, the government coming in and, and just, just slamming the door and, and this is unacceptable and this, you know, this whole thing. That's not how to do it. Um, because when you create a government suppression of something uh, or some group actively, you know, squashes or suppresses, um, you know, with, 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 with legal and with, with military and with police and with force, you know, when you crush, try to crush something out of existence, that doesn't work so good. And just because you're doing that, people will fight against it. People will think there's something worthy and valid and, and important there that should be preserved, right? Um, we, as human beings, I think, tend to react very negatively to, to uh, authoritarian controls, right? Um, when, we, when we're aware of, the, of, of what's going on. So I think that's why Russia is doing it wrong, um, because they have uh, gone in there with force and, and you know, rrr, sort of thing and this is this is awful and so it's a case where they're doing the right thing for the wrong reasons or the wrong the wrong methods and um and i think that's why they're um going to not be as successful as they would like to be with that and it will still remain in you know an, an underground movement sort of thing one can compare it to australia when when scientology was banned there in the 1960s, uh, Scientologists went underground. You know, they, they literally buried their materials, their Scientology books, in boxes in their backyards and met in basements and, you know, uh, obscure houses and things like that. And they would, they would meet up and, and do their Scientology. And then finally, the ban was lifted and Scientology is, you know, still practiced and open and, and you know, flourishing in Australia as much as it is anywhere else. So, so that's not, uh, historically speaking, that, that was not a successful way to get rid of Scientology. And, um, and I don't think that that's how we're, we're going to uh, ever make any inroads into changing the hearts and minds of people. You don't change them with, with force and, and, and guns and things like that. So, so that's why I think that, um, that what Russia did was wrong. I was really hoping that the Belgium case was going to come out differently. Um, the Belgium case, of course, was, was completely dismissed by the judge who said that the prosecutor had done a completely incompetent job and so the whole thing got, got thrown out. 
But we were all hoping that the Belgium case was going to, you know, carry forward to a legal win. And in that case, you had Scientology, um, Scientologists actually on trial for committing crimes. And they were tried in a court of law. And had they been found guilty, that would have shown that in, in, a, in, a, in a legal, you know, f fair situation, that would have shown that Scientology is a corrupt practice that has criminals working for it. And that would have given much more of a, a forward motion to getting people behind the idea that Scientology is not something they should have around and let's get rid of it, right? And that makes a lot more sense to people. So that would be a more, more correct way of going about it. Unfortunately, at this point, I don't think that Scientology is ever going to see um, itself banned from a country through legal means or through legal channels. I don't think, they are, they are too well funded. They have uh, too many lawyers and private investigators and all the rest at their beck and call. And they'll do anything behind the scenes too. And I'm not going to say that they, that they bribe judges and whatnot, but I'm also not going to say that they don't. I don't put anything past Scientology when it comes to obtaining legal victories. And so I don't think that's the way that, that, this, is, that this group, this destructive cult of Scientology is going to be defeated. As I, I don't think that's how it's going to happen. So, Shaka Cohen. Scientologists are indoctrinated to believe many things that most people would consider prejudiced. For example, Hubbard was very anti-homosexual. It seems that one of David Miscavige's favorite ways to discredit someone is to say that they are homosexual. Then there are the rumors about John Travolta using Scientology to hide his homosexuality, etc. When one comes out of a lifetime of Scientology and enters into the WOG world, how difficult is it to reconcile the fact that members of the gay community are not evil? I imagine it would be similar to a person growing up in a family with ties to the KKK if they were to leave one day and disavow the way they were raised. I wonder how difficult it is to reprogram oneself when it comes to such ingrained beliefs, not dealing directly with spirituality or religion, but simply attitudes towards other humans. I'd love to hear your thoughts. This is a great question. Um, I had two things that I immediately ran smack into when I, right when I left Scientology and looked at, start, at, at questioning the practices and questioning Hubbard and, and wondering what was true and what wasn't. And I've, I've mentioned before, these were, these were homosexuality and psychiatry. These were, these were, these are big, big deals in Scientology. Um, I mean, really big, like it's kind of hard to communicate how, how much it's ingrained into Scientologists that, that homosexuality, the LGBT, the, you know, whatever label you want to give or however you want to describe it, um, if it's not straight, conservative, man, woman, marriage, children, you know, family, if it's not that, if it's not right out of the 1950s, then it's wrong. <laughs> it's just wrong. And of course, that's an, that, that is all, it has nothing to do with with the real beliefs of, of, of Hubbard or Miscavige or Scientology, it has to do with control. It has to do with controlling people and controlling them through sex and, and the use of sex, right? Um, so, which is why you have the whole thing about masturbation and stuff in Scientology too. Now, I didn't know about any of that when I first got out of Scientology. I just had these feelings of revulsion and disgust towards homosexuals because of everything I had been indoctrinated over the decades um, in Scientology, right? You are, you are, I mean, right out of Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health, he says it's a mental illness, right? It's, an, it's what he calls an aberration. It's something you have to deal with and handle because it's abnormal, not acceptable behavior, immoral. I mean, all these labels are given to, um, to homosexuality and to any kind of, uh, you know, sexual perverted activity, right? So, so I had a very dim view of this, and I knew I was getting this inkling that there was something really wrong about this, but I couldn't quite get my wits around, well, what, you know, what? Like, I, like the thing that was, that was, that was you know, hammering in my head about it was, 
was I, I, I believe in equal rights, I believe in civil rights, I believe in human rights, and yet, you know, these people are, you don't deserve all these rights and stuff, right? Hubbard says you should, you know, trape them all off somewhere and, and, and shoot them, you know, get rid of them. I mean, he's, he's very, he's got very, some, some very strong statements about, about this. So, so this was the, the push-pull in my head that I had to kind of like, what? Um, and I, and you know, the thing that educated me, that re-educated me, that helped me to, to look at the LGBT community differently, like it kind of forced me to, was I, I started paying a lot more attention and this might sound silly, but it really worked, right, for me, was on was George Takai, uh, the guy who played Mr. Sulo on Star Trek. He is a very strong advocate for gay rights. And <clears throat> in 2013, when I first was going through this uh, process of, of, you know, re-examination and re-evaluation and everything, um, he was posting a lot on Facebook. And a lot of his posts were very, very, very funny. But he also had some biting, like very incisive posts about gay rights and about, homo and about what it means to be a homosexual. And, and I started getting this idea from his posts, from the satirical and humorous but, but very insightful way that he was talking about it over and over again with lots of different approaches it started getting through to me that homosexuality is something that a person is born with. They're, I thought that it was just some crazy, weird thing that they decided and, and that they could undecide it, right? I was part of that stereotype, that anti-homosexual stereotype. I was part of that, that it's just a choice and they can just undecide anytime they want. And, and this is all just, you know ridiculous, uh, you know, nonsense, and they're just choosing to be this way, and, then, and this kind of thing, as though this was somehow derogatory to these people, that it, would, that, that it was this way, right? Um, it was not sensible. It was not logical thinking. It wasn't well thought out. I'm just saying right now, I was, in, I was a fool, right? Uh, and I was fooled by Hubbard and by the things that he had, he had been saying about this. So, so George Takai got me, got me looking at things in a whole new light, and I was very willing to, to look at that, right? Like um, this great one, this one I'll never forget that really was the turning point for me was, was when he posted this uh, video where, um, where somebody asked uh, straight people, right? They went out on the street and they did this survey and they asked uh, heterosexuals, when did you decide to be straight? Right? And, you know, very simple, very easy, uh, you know, de 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 debunking of the whole myth. Uh, but it really got me thinking. And I was like, oh my God, duh, you know, I never decided and neither did they. And oh, wow, you know. Um, and that's not even, and that's just, that was just step, step one for me, right? Because what that's led to now is me, I, I, got, I got nothing on it. Right, like nothing. Like I've shed all that stuff. Um, I don't care whether you choose when you're 12 years old to be homosexual or not. I don't care. Right. I'm just. I was presenting that thing about the choice thing because that was the first brick getting broken through in my head of uh, you know this wall in my head of 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 prejudice. Right. And and when that came down, then other bricks started coming off, and then the whole thing sort of crumbled, and that's how it happened. So it took me reaching for more, you know, education, more information on the subject in order to get past my prejudices, and I think that's also one reason why I embrace education and critical thinking. Um, and, and recognition that, that it's okay to learn more and know more about things because, it, because by doing that, you broaden your, your view and, and tolerance and scope of what, uh, what it means to be human and what it means to be a good person and that sort of thing. So I'm very glad that I was able to go through that process and not hold on to my prejudices. And now I try to apply that to anything else that I run into when I find... Um, prejudicial thinking about anyone or anything, 
I, I try to be mindful of that and I try to be aware of it so I can um, educate myself out of it if I find myself running into those kinds of things. So that's, that's the process. Anon 8109. Congratulations on your continued healing process and I wish you strength moving forward. If it's not too personal a question, what has been the most difficult aspect of the recovery process? Is there still something you wish you could change about how you feel? Again, tough question. Um, I think the most difficult part of the recovery process for me is not knowing what I'm going to run into next that is something I need to be recovering from or need to learn or need to, need to understand that I didn't understand because I didn't know that I didn't know. <laughs> you know, I run into that a lot. Um, I let a fairly, you know, I, I, I resist the, the, the saying that I, that I led a sheltered life because I don't think I led a sheltered life, but I led a cloistered life, I, if there's a difference. I, I, led a, I, I led a life in a bubble world where the, 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 the walls were not physical so much as they were mental. I wasn't letting things in or experiencing things in life. And I wasn't willing to go out and experience things because I was, you know, so focused on what I was doing and so locked into a mindset that was very limiting uh, in what it allowed me to think or what it allowed me to believe or feel or understand. There was a lot of limits placed on, on that. And, and Scientology does that. It's very, very good at it. And it's, it's probably the number one reason why I call it a, a destructive cult is because it destroys your thinking. And so now that I've been free of that for a couple years now, I keep running into things that I didn't know I didn't know. Uh, and I keep running into things that I go, well, how did I not experience that, you know, or how did I not know that? And not necessarily points of cultural literacy, you know, like I know about 9-11 and I know about pop culture things and I know about movies and that sort of thing. There were periods of time that were very, you know, like when I was on the RPF where I, I couldn't see movies and stuff like that. But I, I caught up afterwards, you know. Um, but, uh, but other things, things about social interactions, things about um, life, about how life is, is, is lived, you know. Um, for the first time this year, I filed, you know, I, I own my own business and I filed business taxes. I mean, that's a big thing. You know, I have first time ever. I went and got an accountant. I'm like 46 years old. You know, like this is a new thing for me. These kinds of, of new things where I have not been exposed to things that, you know, a lot of people were exposed to when they were in their 20s and I didn't. So... Um, so, so, so stumbling on those things, fumbling through them, figuring it out anyway, and moving on and, uh, and enjoying my life the whole time anyway, is kind of been how I've navigated this recovery process and continue to do so. And I, and I, I think that is, is an answer to the question. Laura S. Not a Scientology question. When people say they don't believe in the Christian God, do they mean Jesus? Or are they talking about the God as portrayed in the Old Testament? Is this statement meant to imply that there is or could possibly be a supreme deity or higher power, but that Orthodox Christianity fails to properly characterize an accurate picture of who God actually is? I know atheists will use this term pejoratively to delegitimize Christian theology. What do agnostics mean when they specifically claim they don't believe that that God exists? Well, this is pretty unique to each person, I think. I, in fact, I've sort of uh, posited or thought that every single person's religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs are probably as unique to them as their DNA. I don't think any two people in the world have the exact same idea about God or Jesus or spirituality or the afterlife or supernatural beliefs. I, I, I honestly think we are all individual in that regard. So I will answer this question as me. Um, I do not believe in the Christian God, and by the Christian God, I mean anything related to Christianity. You know, the, the um, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, you know, the, the whole Jesus is, is, is God incarnate on earth. 
um, and is my personal savior and, you know, is taking responsibility for my sins and died for my sins and all that. I reject all of that. I don't, I don't, I don't buy into it, it one little bit. I don't think that, um, I don't think that if God exists, that he is knowable to us uh, in any way. And, and I, he, you know, I use the word he, it. I mean, it would be an it. It wouldn't be a he or a she. Um, so I'll say it wouldn't be knowable to us in any way. Because when you, when you start understanding the, the broad scope and breadth and depth of, of this universe and all the things in it and how little we understand, really understand about our own, ourselves, our life, where we come from, where we're going, how much we are even able to be aware of or perceive with our limited senses, I, I think the God question is, is a ridiculous uh, conversation to even be having. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like, um, you know, does an amoeba think about, you know, us? I mean, you know, these advanced life forms, sort of, so to speak, right? I mean, they don't. They don't, you know, there's no evidence that they do or that they could even conceive of it. And I think that's sort of where we're at in relation to any entity that might have been a creator of everything that we experience and know. So that's, I kind of, I, I kind of look at the idea of God as, as so big, so beyond our understanding that I don't even want to talk about it or think about it. And that's why I've sort of put a big, I don't know on it and said that I'm pretty agnostic and I move the more and as, as each day goes on and as, as life, as I learn more and more about organized religion and I learn more and more about science, I move more and more in the direction of uh, the idea that there isn't a, a creator type that any of us have yet been able to personify. I hold out hope that there is more to life than just what we see around us, but there's no proof of that, and so, you know, it's just a hope that I have. Um, I think that a lot of atheism that I've seen, to speak more broadly now about the atheists that I'm aware of or know, uh, I think they are very much rejecting the idea of a Christian God, more so than they're rejecting the idea of, of any kind of creator. Um, atheists, you know, just pretty much just don't have, they haven't accepted a belief which is not exactly the same as some of them have explained to me as as a as a non-belief. It's 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 a it's a very individual thing. So any atheist you talk to, they're going to give you their version of it. Um, you know, because some of them say, you know, well, if I, if I don't believe in God, then that means I absolutely, um, you know, if if I if I can't have any proof of God, then there is no God. And then other ones are more open to, well, yeah, I don't know really, but I'm going to say that there isn't. And there's, you know, and there's, there's different levels or, you know, of this, of this sort of thing. So, um, so that's what I understand from, from the atheists that I've met, that they um, sort of just don't really see any proof of, of a God, especially a Christian God or any of the other 2,000 different versions of gods and, and God that we've had in humanity's history. And I tend to agree with them on that. I don't see any evidence of any of that either. But I still hold out hope that maybe there's something, you know, but not anything that's going to demand me worshiping it. And certainly nothing like I've ever read about in the Bible, uh, Quran, or the book of, Je you know, the, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses book or any of, this, any of that stuff. I don't, I don't buy into any of that. So, um, so that's kind of where I'm coming from with, with my beliefs on that. It's Flash Answers time. Del Tashlin, now that you're out and reevaluating what you believe, is it your desire that Scientology be completely broken down and abolished, or are you more interested in seeing if there is anything salvageable once David Let Him Die Miscavige is rousted? If tomorrow the IRS declared that religious groups would no longer be tax exempt, how would that affect your feelings towards Scientology? In my heart of hearts, I would like to see Scientology uh, gone completely, utterly, totally, and, and like, without reservation. I would like to see everything about it totally wiped out. That's never going to happen. 
that is that is the, my my heart of hearts desire but i am fully cognizant of the fact that it's never going to occur scientology is here forever um, and there's nothing i'm going to do to get rid of it in that sense uh, what i would hope to see happen is the organization of scientology collapse and i believe that that will occur after david miscavige is is, is gone however he goes um, that's my hope you know I have uh, lots of good reasons to hope for that and think that that might be a realistic possibility. I'm also fully aware of the fact that I could be, you know, whistling in the wind and it's here to stay forever and ever and ever. But at least people will know through the efforts of my channel that, and, and, and every other critic who speaks out uh, in every other book and any other video and everything else that we all do, that it is utter, complete, total trash and should not be utilized or uh, joined up with or uh, certainly not be given any of your money. Now, um, if tomorrow the IRS declared the religious groups were no longer tax exempt, uh, that wouldn't affect my feelings towards Scientology, but I'd have a big smile on my face because I, I do believe that, um, that many religious groups, not all, not all, but I do believe that many religious groups need to be taxed because uh, they take far, far, far too much advantage. And uh, we end up paying the cost for that. And I don't think that's, uh, uh, I think the, the, the reasoning for a tax exemption for churches has, has way outlived its usefulness uh, in the majority of, of churches, not all of them, but in the majority of them. So there you go. Failed teacher one. Tony Ortega suggested in a recent interview that the appeals for money had shifted in the noughties, i.e. circa 2000 to 2009. Originally, he claimed the money would have been used to buy new courses for the individual donating. Later appeals would ask for money, which would then be used for the upkeep of the global organization. People apparently got awards, medals I think, if they gave above a certain sum. One chap allegedly gave more than $10 million. I can't help wondering what happens to all the money. What do they do with it? Are overheads high? What is the point of having so much? Seriously, look up the word avarice. And then look up the word greed. And you will understand why it is that Hubbard and now Miscavige sucked up as much money as they did from people. It is really not any more complicated than that. They are greedy, avaricious, horrible people. And they just hold on to the money. It just piles up. That's what's going on with the money in Scientology. So that's the simple, stark, and horrible truth. Navik Darkroom. When you were still in the church, what did you think of Paulette Cooper? When I was still in the church, I did not know who Paulette Cooper was, nor had I ever heard of her. I'd never been exposed to any part of her story, never heard of her book, never seen any inkling of her in any way while I was in the church. She and most critics of the church are uh, kept out of view of most people who are in Scientology because they don't want Scientologists developing that cognitive dissonance that goes on when they start hearing critical things about the church. So instead what they do is they just try to put people in a bubble world where they don't hear anything about it at all. And so we've reached the end of another episode of Critical Q&A. I hope you found these answers interesting and educational and helpful to you. Um, and I hope that if you have any comments or feedback for me at all, you will leave it in the comment section below. I'm wide open to any questions of any kind, Scientology related or not. And um, I look forward to, to getting them. And so um, look forward to the next uh, part in my interview with my mom coming out this next week. And I think you guys are really going to like that series. It gets um, just better and better as it goes. And uh, as mom and I get more and more into um, some real deep stuff about uh, our relationship and about Scientology. And I think, uh, I think it'll be enlightening for a lot of people out there and hopefully helpful to parents and uh, family out there who have people still stuck in Scientology or other destructive cults. So thanks very much for watching and I'll see you guys next week.